1. I'm going to be reading the first nine verses of the opening chapter so that we continue to maintain the context of what James is seeking to do here in his letter to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. James chapter 1, I'll begin reading with verse 1. This is God's word. Again, let's give our attention to it. It is written for your sake. James chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his, humili- uh, his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Amen. This is the word of the living God. Let's pause and ask for his help as we consider verses 9 through 11 of this opening chapter of the letter. Let's pray. Father, now as we sit under your word, indeed we do. It sits in judgment over us. So we, as your servants, we are listening. We ask only that you might speak. We would see Jesus. We would hear from him. In this portion of your word, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Many of you, perhaps, have heard the expression, he who dies with the most toys wins. Let me offer a different twist on those words. In fact, this twist is exactly and precisely the point that James is getting at in these three verses that we're going to consider. How about this? He who dies with the most toys dies. The point, of course, and obviously the point, of course, is that we all are facing death. That death itself is a great equalizer to all that we have enjoyed and do enjoy in this world, whether poor or rich, whether struggling along, uh, impoverished in some capacity, or wealthy beyond means, with more money than you know what to do with, all of us will indeed die, and all of it will be leveled for all of eternity. The problem, of course, in this world that we live, and not merely in the world, but as well in the church, indeed, as James is writing to the church, We have a tendency, all of us, you, me, have a tendency to place our hope and trust in all of the wrong things. We live in an affluent society, and as a result, we have much going for us. Isn't that true? Every one of you, except maybe one, drove a car to church today. Many of our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world don't even have that luxury. We take it for granted, of course. From cars to homes to air conditioning in our offices, in our churches, in our homes, to nearly every modern invention of man, we do enjoy great blessings in this world. Yet those blessings, as good as they are, can trip us up as Christians. They can cause us to lose focus on the fact that we did not enter the kingdom of God based on those things, but upon the lowly one who was exalted as Lord and Savior. It is on his merits alone, therefore, that we place our hope in our trust. Let me ask you just plainly, what are you placing your hope in today? 
Maybe it's your bank account, your job, a relationship or two or many or some other manner or thing. It could be on talent or giftedness. Do you not understand that these things are passing away? Not a one of them are going to survive. I heard somewhere once some Bible teacher said that there's only two truly eternal things in the world, and that's God's Word and people. I suspect he's right. As a Christian especially, you must understand, you need to understand that though you may be wealthy in this world, you only have that due to the kindness of God. You know, the reason you are a child of God today is due to the work of the Holy Spirit who humbled you to understand that it is in Christ alone you stand. This is the message of James in these three verses. As he continues to unpack the message that he presents in early stages of his letter to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, 12 tribes, people, no doubt, different socioeconomic structure, But ultimately, all of them had been planted elsewhere from where they grew up and where they lived. And within that body of believers, within that community of believers, there is clearly the poor and there is clearly the rich. And James makes that very obvious. And Jesus himself said that we will always have the rich among us and we will always have the poor among us. It's always going to be that way, no matter how the government tries to level that and change it. The fact of the matter is, even in the church, there are people that are poor and lowly and rich and affluent. These are the matters in which James turns his attention so that we might rightly understand where we place our confidence in this world. So I want to show you this afternoon that whether we are poor or rich, our boasting is to be in the Lord. Very simple. I want to show you that the Spirit of God here in these three verses is teaching you that whether you are wealthy and have everything you could want in life and more, or whether you are struggling along, limping along day to day, just getting through the week the best you're able, both parties, both camps must boast, not in themselves, boast in the Lord. Two points as we consider these three verses. I've often thought, and in fact this week it strongly reminded that just because there's three verses doesn't mean there's nothing to say. These three verses are full of practical material for the Christian in this world today. Two points. First, we'll consider the boasting of the poor. The boasting of the poor and then Right, you guessed it, the boasting of the rich. The boasting of the poor as identified in verse 9 of our passage, and then the boasting of the rich as identified in verse 10. Two very simple principles, but full of needed instruction for us as God's people. Let's first consider this boasting that James exhorts, indeed commands, the readers in his day and you and me today to do this boasting first let's consider the target of his command who is he speaking to well he continues to speak to the visible church and he reminds them of that very fact when he says let the lowly brother boast he uses that familial term that audience that he's addressing his words here are to christians And this is the way he begins this section, much the same way as we've already taken note of that he did in verse 2 of James 1. He's addressing the visible community of God's people. Now you know what that means. That means that it's the people that we can see that attend worship and and are part of the church and we can look across the room and we can identify who they are. That's what he's doing. He certainly doesn't know with absolute certainty that everybody he's writing to in those days and everybody I'm preaching to now using these words are actually in the kingdom. But at least they're professing to be and they're behaving as such on the outside. This is who he's talking to. He's assuming that they are zealous to follow the Lord and do what he has said. 
But what's interesting, even as you think through a little bit of, his, of the implications of his direction of this command, this target that he offers, he is in some sense addressing unbelievers. Now, you might look down at the verse, and you should always be doing that as I preach. You should never, ever take your eyes, as it were, off the scriptures. I don't mean constantly stare at it the whole time. I want to see your faces. But notice how he is addressing brothers. That means the things that he is saying to Christians are the very opposite things that are not happening for the unbeliever. He tells the Christians to boast, the lowly brother to boast in their exaltation. What's the difference? What's the opposite of that? Well, that means that the unbelievers, they don't boast in their exaltation. And I'm going to explain what that means in a minute. But they boast in themselves. They are depending upon their own abilities and talents and efforts and labors. The exhortation is aimed at them as well, but not in a way to comfort or encourage, but in a way that is dire and, 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 and vitally important that they hear. How many times have you heard people in the world say, boast that I will get to heaven because I'm a good person. Or I'll get to heaven because I haven't done that horrible thing. James would say you're boasting in the wrong things, my friend. You are in a very dire circumstance. You must repent. You must look to Christ. You cannot boast in yourself, for you have nothing to offer. No, instead, they will boast in the fact that they have been cast out of the comfortable presence of God on that great day. But for Christians, the very description of the audience in which he now addresses these things is vitally important as we consider the very contrast of phrases that he uses in verses 9 and 10. Notice the description of the audience he starts with. Let the lowly brother boast. Some translations may have there the humble or poor. The idea that he's getting at here is one of a socioeconomic position. He is talking about literally the poor, financially and otherwise. The poor of the world that have been downtrodden and and, and, and maligned and and, and picked on uh, from the rich and those who would abuse their authority and positions of power. Now when you think of the context of these first nine verses, it makes perfect sense because the majority of these people are probably going without in many different ways as those transplanted from the homes in which they grew up. We also know that this is indeed a socioeconomic issue because the very opposite word he uses in verse 10 for the rich is also a specific term referencing monetary position and societal influence. Now most of you in this room this afternoon are not rich in the classical sense of the term. Now I realize the term itself is somewhat subjective, maybe perhaps as you compare yourself to others, you may think they're rich. I get that. But when we think of the rich, we usually think about people like Bill Gates, who has, I forgot how many billions of dollars. We're thinking about people who are lacking for nothing and would lack for nothing in this world. People who think that all they need is their money and that will solve every problem, every issue, every concern, every crisis. Many of them think just like that. Most of us in this room are of the first category that James is here addressing, the poor or the lowly of the world. Most of you work and live week to week, just enough to live on. But the fact is, and the point of James in this first line of verse 9, is that most of you here today are rich beyond measure, though poor. In fact, I would suggest, I would say, I would declare boldly that every one of you who names the name of Christ today are richer than the richest person on this planet and always will be for eternity. And I'm going to show you why in a few moments. 
The whole instruction of this command is one of boasting. He wants the people of low estate to boast. He, he wants them to brag. Now, normally when we read about boasting and bragging in the scriptures, what do we typically read? Don't do that. Let another man praise you and not your own lips. And it, you know, it goes on and on, doesn't it? We're often warned against boasting. Why? Because typically, because of our fallen condition, we boast in ourselves. We can't wait to tell somebody, either subtly or directly, how great we are. And this is not James' point at all. He's certainly not telling the lowly of the world or the rich of the world to boast in themselves. Notice how he qualifies it. He qualifies it that they might boast in their, or more specific to the text, his exaltation. The subject of their boasting is not in themselves at all. It has nothing to do with them whatsoever. They are lowly. They are poor people. They have nothing to offer this world. They have nothing to offer anybody. They are treated with scorn. They are treated with contempt. Yet James tells them to boast. To boast in their exaltation. It reminds me, and it should remind you of a, an event that took place some 2,000 years ago in the countryside of Judea to a virgin who was not rich by any means. Joseph and Mary were poor people. They didn't have enough money for much. They didn't have any lodging to speak of. They were just the poor and lonely of the world. And God in his providence and his divine sovereignty and will and purpose chose this woman to carry the Lord Jesus Christ. And you read and you should read and even meditate deeply upon what we know as the Magnificat, taken from Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 46. But in verse 52 we read there, as Mary is speaking she says he has brought down the mighty from their thrones and note exalted those of humble estate it was Jesus himself who said that it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven that I came to seek and to save those who were lost I came to help the poor and the downcast of the world James wants the poor and lowly who have nothing to offer at all to boast in the exaltation that's been granted to them through the work of Christ. He wants them to know and he wants you to know and understand that while you may be part of the poor and lowly of the world, as a Christian you have much to boast in. You boast in Christ. You boast in His work as He has worked to exalt you to a place that you can never, ever lose. There are two factors here as we consider this command to boast in their exaltation. First, that their humble estate should cause them to know their exalted state. I mean, when you're at the bottom of the barrel, so to speak, there's not much room, there's not much it doesn't take a whole ton of effort to look up because there's not much to look down for. As the poor and lowly of the world, it is easier for them to acknowledge and to see this exalted state that came through no efforts of their own, but through the work of the Savior himself. Their humble estate should also lead them to secure, should also cause them to meditate and think upon the great riches that the world cannot offer them. What are those riches and whose exaltation should they be boasting? This opening phrase in 1 9 sounds familiar, it should, because in some sense, and uh, though James was probably written before. Paul's great hymn in Philippians chapter 2 
Scripture has a glorious way of harmonizing with itself. Who does it remind you of when you think of a lowly person who is exalted? What did Paul say? That this one humbled himself even to the point of death, even death on a cross, he became a servant. And what happens? Therefore, God has what highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. James wants these people to know their exalted state in Christ and through Christ and because of what Christ has indeed done for them, the poor and the lowly. What has he done? So I was working on this sermon. I was reminded of another sermon I'd preached a long time ago uh, from Philippians chapter 2, as a matter of fact, as I was working through the issues related to Jesus giving up, uh, giving of himself and humbling himself and what all of that meant. Let me offer three things that lowly people gain that is greater than all the riches in the world through the work of Christ. First, we note that Jesus himself gave up his favorable, favorable relation to the divine law. He, the law giver, became the, the one who was subservient to the law. In his incarnation, he voluntarily took this burden unto himself, began to carry that away. The spotless Lamb of God, who knew no sin, became sin for us in order that we might be the righteousness of God in him. What does that mean for you? It means this, that the lowly can rejoice in the lowly one because through him the demands of the law are no longer a curse to you. He took that curse. He paid that price. You couldn't keep it, but he did. Second, Jesus gave up tremendous riches in order that he might make us rich. 2 Corinthians 8 9 states it quite plainly. Though he was rich, yet for our sakes, for your sake, he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. He gave up everything, even his very own life. He was born in a stable, buried in a borrowed tomb. He borrowed a room in which to celebrate the final Passover. He didn't own anything. He didn't even have a place to lay his head. He didn't have a home that you enjoy and benefit. You, had more than, you have more now than he ever had in life. All of this is true about him, and he was indeed poor. It took upon himself the greatest of debts, the iniquity of every sinner that looks to him. How does this apply in the words of James here in James 1.9? Well, it does in this way, that the lowly can rejoice and boast in Christ because though he was rich, he became poor for our sakes. That means simply this, my friends, if you know Christ today, you are rich beyond measure. Indeed, there is no way to measure it. You will never regret it. You will have more than all of the people in the world have right now for eternity. And we're not talking about money. We're talking about the glorious inheritance that only Jesus Christ, through him becoming poor, can give to poor, sinful, lowly people. There's another thing. Isn't it true that Jesus gave up his heavenly glory, that he might come rescue lowly sinners? Jesus himself was very aware of this as he prayed in John 17 in his high priestly prayer. That he, the glory that he enjoyed with his Father before all worlds might be restored. And indeed it was. From this eternal glory that the Son had with his Father from all worlds, he willingly descended into the realm of misery. In other words, he was willing to become poor. But more than that, into the, it, that he might pitch his tent, tabernacle with, Sinners, poor people, that he might rescue them from their awful condition. 
the very one of whom the seraphim covered their faces in Isaiah 6 and the object of the most solemn adoration for all of eternity voluntarily descended to the realm where he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Why? That you, the lowly, might boast in his labor the exaltation that he gives to you. The lowly can rejoice in Christ because for our sake he was willing to be despised and rejected of men, but not only of men. Not only of men, but of his own Father. Father, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Because your sin, you lowly of the world, your sin was on him. Your sin, your specific sin, not some generic blob of sin for some blob of humanity, your sin. And if I could go around the room and start naming your names, that's exactly what I would do because it's precisely what happened. He was willing to take that scorn and shame in the just judgment that was ours from his Father that we might be exalted on that great day and be counted as heirs, joint heirs of Christ and to serve alongside of him for all of eternity. Oh, indeed, the lowly have much to look forward to and have secured great things in this life. They have much to boast in. He boasts the exaltation that comes through Jesus Christ alone. To that we should all be very thankful. Indeed, the lowly and the poor of this world, they do not need to look at their present circumstances. It's tempting to do so. They've been exalted through Christ who was humbled for their sake. It was Matthew Henry who said this way, No condition of life puts us out of a capacity of rejoicing in God. If we do not rejoice in Him always, it is our own fault. Those of low degree may rejoice if they are exalted to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom of God. Whatever you're facing today, poor, not poor, Rich, not rich. Circumstance, issues, trials, struggles, worry about the future, all of it. If you have Christ, you are rich beyond measure. You have the very king of the universe as your elder brother, and your high priest, and the lover of your soul who will never let you go. Well, James encourages the lowly of the world. But now James turns to the other side of the issue, doesn't he? He flips a coin over. What about the rich? When mindful of the fact that the Savior himself has said that it's difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom of God, you know the story of the rich young ruler who could not give up his stuff, feed the poor, and went away sorrowful. James addresses the rich in verse 10. And he says, the rich in his humiliation. What? One would expect that James would tell the rich the very same thing. And we might expect that. That's not what he does. First, the target of the command here is still governed by the head verb that is given in verse 9. The verb for boasting. This verb, this command, is still controlling the text. And so the rich now are being commanded to do something as well. They are being commanded to boast. The question that needs to be answered interpretively in this passage is this. Are these rich people Christians? If you look at verse 9, you notice that he qualifies the lowly as brothers. But when you look at verse 10, James leaves that term out. And so one has to labor and wrestle with that question of who are these people? 
Are they Christians or are they not? I will tell you that I spent, I don't know how long it was, well, I, as a friend of mine says, I tend to overthink things, so I probably did, but I spent enough time trying to understand so that I might preach faithfully the scriptures to you whether these people are Christians or not. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the two prevailing and dominant views that govern this section of James, and then I'm going to tell you what I think it is. First, the first view is that these rich people are not part of the family of God. That is, James is contrasting those in the family with those rich outside the family who put their hope and trust in their riches and possessions. And there are many people like that in the world today and in the church. They're not clinging to Christ. Oh, they got him there somewhere. He's like a caboose on the back of the train. Instead, he should be the engine that drives the whole thing. Or he's like a cherry on top of a Sunday. We stick him on somewhere in the week, probably on Sunday for a few hours. And then we go about our business putting all of our hope and trust and confidence in our 401ks and our great jobs. They're not holding on to Christ alone. These people will be led to an awful and terrible end. So perhaps James is addressing the unbeliever. The problem, of course, with that position is that then one would have to ask whether James thinks there's any rich people in the church at all. And certainly there is. I can give you examples of examples in Scripture of rich people. Abraham, rich. Joseph of, Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man who gave his, borrowed, gave his tomb for Christ to be buried in. And I could go on. The second view, and the view that I finally landed on and believe is the intention of the Spirit here, is that these rich people are the very opposite of what I just said. The only opposite of that is that they're Christians. They're in the family. And it seems to me that the target of the command is aimed at those people. Though I understand the temptation to take the other view. It's the view. The other view was the one I held for about two hours. Maybe three. And then I was convinced otherwise. Who are these people then? Well, James describes them as the rich. Rich brothers in the church. Rich Christians. These are people that have no want as opposed to the lowly and outcast of society. They have everything going for them. Yet James tells them not to boast in their exaltation, but to boast in their humiliation. Why? Why change the focus in the instruction of the command, though still to boast? Why does he move the subject now to humiliation? Well, precisely because, as James uses here, the word that is translated humiliation in verse 10, it comes, it's the noun form of the verb that is used, in other words, boast in the fact that they have been humiliated. Not in an embarrassing way, but they have come to realize that it's not their money that will save them. They have learned that it's not enough to trust in riches and wealth. They've learned that it's difficult to put their whole hope in Jesus Christ if they keep doing that when they have their money with them. They've learned that they must be willing to forsake all for the sake of Christ, including their money even as Jesus told that rich young ruler. They have been humiliated. How? Through the powerful work of the Spirit who has overwhelmed the mindset of most because of living in a fallen world that if we have riches and if we have wealth and if we have fame and if we have material possessions and if we have all of those things, we're good, we're set, we're fine. And none of it will account to anything on that great day, none of it will. Though Jesus says certainly that it is harder for the rich to enter the kingdom of God, it is certainly not impossible. 
And James is not here saying by any means that the rich cannot or will not be in the church. He is saying that they should boast as they understand, have been caused to understand, that their hope is in Jesus Christ alone and only in Him alone. That their money cannot buy their salvation, that their money and their fame will not earn them their salvation. There is nothing they can put stock in in this life. It is Christ. It is Christ only. And James tells us why. He tells them why. In the back half, the last half of verse 10 and verse 11. The reasons. James makes this striking statement to them is because earthly treasures will pass away. Look what he says, verse, the end of verse 10, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away, for the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls and its beauty perishes, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. James is using one of his classic analogies, which he does throughout the letter, to highlight first that the earthly treasures of this life will indeed pass away. They will. I know this is an overused illustration, but have you ever seen a hearse towing a U-Haul? Maybe you have, but it doesn't mean much. Jesus tells us to set our treasures in heaven, not on earth. Why? Because that's where moth and rust destroy and thieves come in and steal. Your money your fame, your efforts, your wealth, your notoriety, all of it is passing away. You're not taking it with you. But not only are the earthly treasures passing away, notice that he highlights also that man is passing away as well. In other words, you're going to die. And all that money that you trusted and all that wealth that you had won't accomplish a thing. It will come to nothing. What does it profit a man, Jesus says, to gain the whole world for you children? What does it profit a person to have pizza every dinner, every night for dinner? Go out to restaurants and do all sorts of fun things, amusement parks and everything else, but not have Christ. What does it profit you? Adults, what does it profit you to work yourself insane, to earn as much money as humanly possible so that you can be happy and comfortable and, and lose your soul? Is there a price tag? James says you're going to die. You place your hope in riches, you're in big trouble. You place your hope in Christ, you're safe. For the Christian rich person who can boast, they boast not in their riches, they boast in the fact that the Spirit of God has humbled them. That they might know what it means to give all for the sake of Christ. So you and I, we do not boast, you do not boast in yourself or your condition or your wealth or material goods. We boast in the Lord Himself. Those little words that we read from Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, maybe now you know why I read them. Whether poor or rich, our boasting must also always be in the Lord himself. He became poor for our sake, but then was made rich in his exaltation due to his humiliation. So you see, he who dies with the most toys, he just dies. He enters the life to come with the same amount of stuff as the poor. Death is a great equalizer. It levels the playing field. The poor are glad and they can boast and rejoice because they are rich in Christ. And the rich are glad because they have been made to see that their greatest possession is Christ. Have you been made to see that? Do you see him that way? Do you look and pray and plead and do you praise the God of heaven for making you so wealthy? There is no earthly way, no heavenly way to measure it. In Jesus Christ, you are rich 
and you have every reason to boast in him. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for the great gift, the gift that cannot be measured or numbered, the gift of Christ, the gift of forgiveness of sin, that we can boast in the exalting work of the Savior, and we can boast in the fact that we've been humbled to see our greatest need. May you help us that we might always seek to store up treasures in heaven, seek your kingdom, and we always boast in the work of the Lord himself, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen.